right, are we ready to go? Has everybody got a seat and a cup of coffee? Keep it going. Um, I'm just going to start with some housekeeping first. There is a fire, fire exit behind me here at the door and another one at the end as you came in. The toilets are in the lobby. And can you all switch off your, your sound on your phones, please, now at this stage? I would like to welcome you all to Sligo Central Library this evening. I'd also like to, wel like to welcome all those from around the world watching us on our live stream on Facebook, which Didi wrote here. The live stream of this event will be available to watch on our website in the coming days. We, in association with IT Sligo, ICBA in Writing and Literature, are honoured to have Mr. Gareth Carr and Dr. Marion Dowd read for us here tonight. Alice Lyons of the BA in Writing and Literature degree at IT Sligo will moderate questions and answers with each author. This will be followed by an open mic. I would just, I'm just going to about hand you over to Alice, but just, I just want to tell you about what's happening next month. We're going to be having author Mary Costo here for the February ev event of the word. And in April, we hope to have um, Stephen Sexton. Stephen Sexton, isn't it? Yeah, poet Stephen, Stephen Sexton. And um, I think that's it. So I'm just going to hand you over to Alice. And we're ready to go. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to The Word. Um, my name's Alice, and you're all very welcome. I want to thank Sligo Central Library and Michelle and all the staff here for all that they do to make this series happen. And of course, my colleague Una Mannion as well for all she does, um, and the co my colleagues on the writing and literature course um, for keeping this going. And I'm really excited for the readers that we have tonight. We have two writers who are working on the subject of borders and boundaries in very different ways, and, and also culture, landscape, um, in the case of Dr. Marion Dowd, um, archaeology, and um, Marion has authored a book called The Archaeology of Irish Caves, um, and she has also edited a collection of books on the ideas of darkness in, in Irish culture and archaeology. Um, I was reading something very interesting about Marion's work. Um, recently, Marion discovered in a cave in County Clare a butchered bare bone that um, was significant in what it um, did to push back the date of human habitation in Ireland two and a half thousand years. So you might hear a little bit more about that in Marion's reading. Marion is going to read first, and then she'll be followed by Garrett Carr, who um, is the author of The Rule of the Land, uh, Walking Ireland's Border which is a very um, relevant book considering come two days from now, within 48 hours, we'll have a, a land frontier here between the EU and the UK. And um, some years ago, Garrett walked the entire border and then mapped and wrote it. Um, and you'll hear about that when he reads from The Rule of the Land, which was also um, a BBC Four Book of the Week um, some time ago. So. Without any further ado, I'll introduce Marion. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And I'd like to thank Alice and Una for the invitation to be here this evening. And uh, yeah, it's wonderful to see so many people out on such a cold uh, January evening. I'm going to read three pieces from three totally different uh, publications of mine, and I wanted to pick pieces that are linked with boundaries or borders in some sense to complement Gareth's work. Let me know if you can't hear me at the back. So the first piece I'm going to read is from my book, The Archaeology of Caves in Ireland, uh, which was published in uh, 2015. And I guess caves are, are very much kind of boundary locations in the landscape. Um, the archaeology that we find in them usually tells very unusual stories about kind of marginalized experiences. Uh, and part of the reason that they're so special or so kind of significant, I think, is because of the sensuous environment um, within them. So I'm going to read a section called Sensuous Spaces. The unique environment of caves and its impact on the physical, sensory, and emotional self was fundamental to how past populations engaged with the underground. Much has been written about the sensory deprivation and stimulus hunger experienced within caves, 
but an alternative way of viewing the same phenomenon is to consider that the dark, silent word, world of caves offers a unique opportunity to avail of heightened and intensified sensory experiences. As the normal, everyday stimuli that assault the sensory organs are stripped away and sight becomes redundant, other senses come to the fore, particularly hearing and touch. Sensory experiences are amplified in the absence of competing, intrusive, and distracting variables. In this way, even the most mundane experiences are transformed. The smell of burning wood or decomposing debris is more pungent. Food eaten underground and in the dark tastes stronger. Caves offer an intense awareness of sensory experiences, something human beings are generally not accustomed to. Individuals may feel, feel more sensuous or sensual. Hence, the effect that caves have on the human senses is at once both oppressive and overwhelming. In the words of Tolan Smith, there are few ways of feeling more human than to find oneself in a deep cave when the lights go out. A consequence of the lack of sensory stimuli in caves is that it can induce altered states of consciousness. Jean Plot has gone as far as to suggest that caves are hallucinogenic places. Such experiences can be achieved through sensory deprivation, prolonged social isolation, intense pain, vigorous dancing, insistent rhythmic sounds such as chanting, or the consumption of hallucinogenic substances. Caves are therefore highly powerful, even dangerous places in the landscape where individuals might have visions, hallucinations, or out-of-body experiences. The silence of deep caves is almost painfully oppressive to ears accustomed to the constant and varied sounds of life in the world above. Perhaps to compensate for this, auditory hallucinations are sometimes experienced deep underground. Several cavers have told me of hearing human voices or strange sounds when inside caves for long periods of time. During a BBC4 radio recording in Port Coon Cave, County Antrim, photographer Andy McEnroy commented on how the team were stopped in our tracks by the strangest noises. It sounded like a chatter of children's voices. In the past, natural or imagined sounds may have been perceived as voices from the spirit world. This might explain the prophetic qualities associated with, for example, Greek oracular cave cults. Silence in caves can also be deliberately manipulated or distorted to accentuate or amplify sounds, chanting, music, and singing. This feature was recognized and exploited during the Upper Paleolithic. Resonant chambers and passages in French caves are more likely to contain art than non-resonant areas. Smell can signify an intense form of intimacy with a person, object, or place. Caves contain and amplify odors, and some underground activities may have been strongly associated with particular olfactory experiences. Indeed, certain odors may have been an intrinsic aspect of certain ritual activities in caves. The smells contained underground ra range from the nauseating odor of decomposing animal carcasses or human corpses to the dankness of damp earth, the pungency of animal feces, and the musty smell of dens. Odors have the potential to evoke memories and feelings which within caves, and particularly if trips involved communing with the spirit world or visiting the remains of the dead, may have been quite potent and powerful. In Neolithic Ireland, there is evidence that caves were used for burial with corpses laid unprotected on cave floors. People visiting caves during the months or years that it took for a body to decompose would have been confronted by strong odors and, to our mind at least, disturbing imagery. At other times, some of the smells contained within caves related to domesticity. Caves that were inhabited during the early medieval period, for instance, would have been filled with the smells of food preparation, cooking, smoking hearths, and craft activities. Caves heavily influence bodily posture and movement. Moving through a subterranean landscape is almost always slow and deliberate. Each step requires concentration and care unless one is intimately familiar with the site. A great deal of physical interaction takes place between the human body and the body of the cave. It may be necessary to lean against cave walls, 
to hold onto boulders, to crawl through low passages, to squeeze through narrow openings, to wade through water, to crouch over under overhangs and twist to navigate awkward areas. People often feel the urge to leave their mark on the cave environment in the form of paintings, carvings, finger flutings, and graffiti. Simultaneously, the cave leaves its mark on the human body. People can emerge from the underground bloodied and bruised. More serious accidents and fatalities are a real possibility in what can often be a hostile environment. Clothing is muddied and torn. For prehistoric people, this marking of the body and clothing, which are physical and visible evidence of subterranean sojourns, may have been potent, particularly for those who never ventured beyond cave entrances. People throughout the world have been profoundly aware of the potential of caves to transform an individual emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and socially. This transformative aspect is most apparent and symbolic when an individual emerges from a cave into the outside world. This can be a profound experience. Colors, sounds, and smells are never more vivid, vibrant, or intense as the body adjusts to a sensory overload following the sensory deprivation of the deep cave environment. If and when people spent long periods immersed in darkness, such as the ritual practitioners who operated in the deepest parts of caves in late Bronze Age Ireland, emerging into daylight may have been akin to a symbolic rebirth or rejuvenation. This was a physical and symbolic departure from the sacred spirit world and a return to the world of the living. Leaving the darkness, calmness, and silence of a cave can also generate strong emotions ranging from relief to distress to grief. So the next piece I'm going to read is uh, from an essay associated with um, Tommy Weir's current exhibition on children's burial grounds, which is in the dock in Carrick and Shannon. Uh, it's a superb exhibition, and I'd really recommend you go and see it if you haven't already. Um, these children's burial grounds are called Killini. There's over 1,500 of them in Ireland, and they were used for the burial of unbaptized children. Uh, and they were always uh, placed at boundary locations in the landscape. Though liminal, the locations chosen for Killini were also potent places in the landscape, associated in popular consciousness with the supernatural. Ring forts, for instance, were highly charged and believed to be the realm of the fairies, while abandoned early monastic closures were recognized as relating to earlier generations of Christians. The sanctity of many of these older sites meant that they were treated with respect and they therefore offered a safe, protected space in which to place the unbaptized. Even if they were rarely visited following a burial, the community was keenly aware of the presence of Killini. Many had a local name, such as Bortna Galini, the Field of the Girls, near Turin in County Waterford, a site that was reserved exclusively for the burial of stillborn and unbaptized girls. Misfortune befell anyone who disturbed a Killeen. Folk tales tell of a man who ploughed a Killeen at Kilquan, County Kerry, turning off infant bones as he progressed. Every night he was woken by the sound of crying babies until he returned the field to its former state and ceased ploughing. Similarly, a farmer and his horses died suddenly after ploughing a Killeen near Briscilla, County Leash. The warning was clear. Interfering with or damaging these burial grounds should be avoided at all costs. Signs of restless infant spirits were often observed at night. The sound of children playing football or babies crying could be heard issuing from Killini or lights were seen hovering overhead. A flax mill located near a Killeen at Grange County Sligo was visited by wandering spirits at night. Each morning, the workmen noted little footprints in the mill dust strewn on the floor. So I'm going to, to uh, finish with the final piece um, on the fairies, or better known in Irish as the she. Uh, in recent years, I've become really interested in the interplay between folklore and archaeology and how so many of our archaeological monuments in Ireland are associated with the she. Uh, and archaeologists always keep that divide. They tend not to look at the folklore, but I think it's a really important aspect. It's another layer in how these monuments have been interpreted 
and used. Uh, this was published in 2018 in the Cambridge Archaeological Journal, and I doubt I'll ever get a better title for an academic paper again. Uh, the title is Bewitched by an Elf Dart, Fairy Archaeology, Folk Magic and Traditional Medicine in Ireland. Several explanations were provided as to the origin of the she. They were usually believed to be fallen angels who had been cast out of heaven by God and lived amongst humans in the hope that they would someday return to heaven. These fallen angels were not good enough to be saved nor bad enough to be lost. Some of the she were considered to be deceased humans and folklorist John O'Sullivan said it is very difficult to draw a clear line of demarcation between the kingdom of the dead and the fairy world. The good people inhabited an intervisible preternatural realm that coexisted alongside the world of mortals. They were everywhere around and had the power to go in every place. They might appear individually or in their hundreds and thousands. The she were normally invisible, though they lived parallel lives to humans. They kept cows, they enjoyed whiskey, hurling, Gaelic football, music, singing and dancing. They liked gold, milk and tobacco, but they hated iron, fire, salt, urine and Christianity. <laughs> Great combination. Um, accounts vary as to their size. They could be larger than humans, smaller or of equal stature. In one account from County Donegal, Male fairies were described as wearing blue breeches and red caps, while their female counterparts wore green dresses. They were all about 75 centimetres in height. I love the preciseness of that. The fairies carried out a similar range of domestic and agricultural activities as undertaken by humans. They could assume the appearance of an animal, and hares in particular were often considered fairies in disguise. There was plentiful evidence of the existence of the she in the human world, including unexplained maladies, accidents, spoiled food, poor harvests, and bad luck. Farm produce and farm animals were constantly under threat from fairy activities, and various practices and folk magic were necessary to avert interference. Milk and butter, for instance, were often stolen or spoiled by the fairies. Fairies could milk a cow and therefore take her, causing her to die or stop producing milk. Evidence of malevolent she activities was regularly noted by communities and recounted in oral tradition, particularly if humans interfered with a fairy place such as a prehistoric burial cairn or an early medieval ring fort. One of the greatest threats posed by the fairies was their tendency to kidnap or take a human infant or an adult, particularly marriageable young women, leaving an ugly contrary changeling in its place. The changeling would pine away and die, leaving the human forever in the power of the fairies. Childbirth was a particularly vulnerable time for mother and baby, with an increased chance of being taken. Blindness in adults was also often attributed to the she, usually after the individual had glimpsed the fairy world. Many of the themes in she stories revolve around life events that evoke great anxiety and grief the loss of livestock with the resultant threat of poverty and eviction, the death of a child, any untimely or unusual death, inexplicable illnesses in adults, the symptoms of which we would now see as mental health issues, and mental or physical disabilities in young children that only became apparent as they grew older. In this way, the she provided an explanation for difficult life events, calamities, and experiences. In many ways, they represented the daily anxieties experienced by the millions of poor tenant farmers and labourers in Ireland who were never too far removed from the prospect of starvation, poverty and eviction. Other fairy stories, however, reflect wishful thinking, prolific cows, food mysteriously appearing, purses never without money, magical powers acquired or erotic love between a fairy woman and mortal man. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming along. Thank you, Alice, for inviting me. And uh, everyone I met today as well. I did a, a little uh, class in the, in the IT. Um, 
I'm from just across the bay. Killy Beg's kind of going to go. And I'm funny, I used, to look, I used to look across the bay. You couldn't see Sligo where I'm from, but there was a bay. I knew Sligo was over there. And this used to be like the metropolis to be. Just, <laughs> and I used to hitchhike here as a kid to get art materials because there was no art shops. Well, there might have been one in Leather County, but I liked going around the bay. So, uh, so that I used to come here for that. Um, and it's great to be back. I didn't get a hotel that time. Um, <clears throat> it's probably because I was thinking about that, because I was thinking about uh, where, the coast where I grew up and uh, Sleeve League, which you can probably see from, here, from uh, just a little bit north of here, I imagine, on, on a clear day. Um, and maybe even fairies. Thinking of uh, William Allenham's poem, The Fairies, where uh, one of them goes on a stately journey from Sleeve League to the Rosses. Um, <clears throat> and so I thought of this, I'm going to talk about the border again shortly, but I thought I'd read something, a part of something, which I've never read before, but hopefully it'll be all right. And this is uh, fiction, certainly. Um, and it's got something to do with caves, because they reckon maybe the oracle at Delphi in Greece started with a cave that may have had some kind of sulfur emerging from it. That, so if you went down to it, it could, it could, uh, you'd have a lack of oxygen, you might have a vision. Um, and then eventually it was all built up, and the oracle actually became a person, became a woman who, uh, who sat above this cave and gave her predictions. And of course, it features in lots of stories and, and myths and legends. But it, is an actual, it was an actual place, and there was, an, there was a, an oracle. And long before I knew any of that, I loved that term, that language, the oracle at Delphi. I just thought it was a beautiful term I didn't, before I even knew what it was. And then, then I had this idea, the oracle at Glen Column Kill. <laughs> I wish you just had that. Glen Column Kill, as you may know, is a, it's a small village near Sleeve Lake. So, so I had a title, and I thought, so there's a story here set in Ireland, and it's Ireland exactly as it is, the Ireland I grew up in, except for one small difference, the oracle is not at Delphi, the oracle is at Glen Column Kill. And there's a girl who's just done her leave insert, and she got the highest points in the country. And she's had her photograph in the Donegal Democrat. And, but the problem is she's divided. She's got lots of offers of places in Oxford and Cambridge, but her mother wants her to stay in Donegal. So she's got this decision to make. And so she decides to do something she's never done before, which is to go and consult with the oracle. I think I might need to bring that back. So this is about, this is from the middle of the story. As everyone is aware, Apollo's temple, home to the oracle, is on our coast, near the village of Glen Colum Kill. I had never been there, but now I decided to visit the oracle for advice. Dad, of course, hated such superstitious carry-on. Mammy was a good Catholic, but flexible enough to see that the oracle could have something to offer too. Many solemn churchgoers slipped off occasionally to consult the oracle. Both my parents insisted on coming for the half hour drive. We set off early, mammy driving, dad grumbling in the back seat. The road up to the temple is fierce dramatic. It clings to the black cliff high above the sea. Sometimes all you can see through the windscreen is sky and you feel you're about to plunge off the edge of the world. Close to our destination, Mammy told me something I'd never known. She herself had once visited the Oracle when I was a baby. I was born premature and spent more than two months in a glass tank in Letterkenny Hospital. She'd needed to know if I would be limited in some way because of my early arrival. It was a hard time, Dad said quietly from the back seat like the feeling you get when you see a 30-foot wave coming at you, side on. Well, that's nice to hear, Mammy said, suddenly enraged. Yet you took every berth you could get for that whole time away to sea and left me to manage alone. Keep your eyes on the road, said Dad. What did the oracle tell you? I asked Mammy. She gathered herself up again. I was ushered into her room, she said, but took one look and turned and left. One of our dinner ladies I, we had when I was a schoolgirl, she'd become the oracle. Now, I'm sure she was a perfectly good oracle. They're just channels anyway. Their powers of prediction is in that tea they drink. 
I just couldn't take her seriously. But you needn't worry, Bridget. They have a different woman these last 15 years, and she's highly rated. From the car park, there was another 20-minute hike along the cliff. I put on my Mac, for there was a drizzle in the air, and I took my offerings from the car boot. It was off-season, and we were the first of visitors to arrive that morning. The busiest days for the Oracle were Apollo's birthday and St. Patrick's Day, even though those two would be considered contradictory characters. Most of us know the famous quote from Ireland's former president, Eamon de Valera. Apollo's temple is nothing but a mole on the otherwise unblemished face of Christian Ireland, cited here only due to the bad navigation of some foolish Greek. My father stayed in the car, and tradition meant my mother would only accompany me as far as the first pillar. There were lots of granite pillars along the path, sticking out from the boggy ground. The remains of the original temple, long since destroyed. The Oracle's temple was wrecked several times over the centuries, usually by order of the bishop or, or a diktat from Rome. But it would always be rebuilt and running again within a season or two. The pillars are now used to display words of wisdom from the Oracle. Her attendants chisel them into stone. Collectively, these statements have become known as the Donegal Maxims, and some of them are famous. Get over yourself. <laughs> Don't spend it all at once. And say nothing, and you'll hear more. <laughs> Up ahead, among a scattering of large broken blocks, stood a bungalow with a slate roof. It looked strange across, of course, alone among the ruins and built close to the cliff edge. But it was a grand little bungalow with double glazing. I pushed the doorbell. A shuffling figure took shape in the door's patterned glass. In those days, the Oracle's attendants were always men, and the role would attract all sorts of oddballs, of which there was no shortage in this area. This fellow had dirty cuffs and specks of jam in his stubble. He let me in and said, so? May I talk to the oracle, I asked. He put out his hand. For a moment, I thought he meant to shake hands, but then I realized he wanted my offering. I hung the plastic bag on his fingers like he was an inanimate hook. Ma'am, Mammy had brought me to Marks and Spencer's especially, as we had heard the oracle liked their pre-cooked meals. I left them in the branded bag so he could see the effort we'd gone to. The shop was over an hour's drive. Nowadays, payment is simpler. Cash is preferred, and you can pay in advance if you book online. Grand, he said, with a dip of his head. He indicated a door at the end of the corridor. Suddenly, there I was in the Oracle's chamber. So Thank you. That, by the way, was a commission for Radio 4, so if you want to hear the rest, you can. It's online. So, we were talking about caves, weren't we, Marion? Um, so, obviously, I grew up quite close to the border, and uh, when I was a kid, as I'm sure many, many of you will remember, it was, a, it was a hard border. We didn't have the term then, but that's what it was. So you had customs on one side and army on the other side, and crossing it was quite a, a confrontational sort of process. Um, then, of course, we had the single market, EU single market in 93, uh, Good Friday Agreement in 98, and both those agreements together removed all that infrastructure, and suddenly it was just open, invisible country. And it seemed like a good time to go back and look at it again. And the principle was quite simple. And instead of thinking of the border as a problem, I, I thought I'd look at it as a place and as a landscape and even a culture. And that was the idea. So off I went. Uh, started in the east and moving west. And I wrote about it and I, I made maps also. So, and of course I'm hearing lots of things along the way. And I found out about some potholders uh, under Quilka Mountain. Quilka Mountain, as you may know, is between, uh, marks the border actually between Cavan and Fermanagh. 
for a good stretch. It was also the highest point of the border. Well, it was not that high, really, but it's the highest point of the border. Um, so I, I, wanted to, I wanted to get into this story, so I went to meet these potholders. Now, I have to admit, I was a wee bit concerned about this. I thought it might be a wee bit old hat. So I seem to remember, like, when I was a kid, it was a bit of a Sunday tea time kind of thing, going potholing. It would sort of be on, it would be on Blue Peter or something. They'd send, they'd send some presenter to go potholing. So I was a bit suspicious, like, that it might be a bit staid as a kind of a, as a feature, you know? But um, a couple of things attracted me to it. Number one was that there was always these stories about tunnels under the border used for smuggling. Um, in my opinion, that's false. I don't think that's... I don't think it's true. I think it's a kind of a, a, a what did you call that? A kind of a new myth. Um, and the other thing was that these were explorers, these potholers, in a quite an old-fashioned kind of way. And they wanted to, they wanted to have that thrill of exploration in a, in a world that was already covered. And so I, thought, I did quite like this idea. So I went and had a chat with them anyway. And I will read a little bit of that. Back in Belfast, I meet with a gang of cavers who are exploring beneath Quilca. They are Stephen, Jock, and Rocky. Two of those names are nicknames. Nicknames develop among ca cavers as they can help avoid confusion in the dark confines of the tunnels, especially in the Quilca group, as they have lots of Connors and Stevens. They are practical, self-effacing, not given to romanticizing their adventures, no, mo no matter how much I try to encourage them. They are just looking for undiscovered places in a fully mapped world and have realized that this means they have to get under the planet's skin. Their rewards are the camaraderie, the satisfaction of opening new caves, and the thrill of being first. People have been walking around in Ireland for 10,000 years, Jock says, but nobody has ever seen these caves and chambers before. The adventure is about rooted in taking care, planning, and preparation. Making 20 feet of progress might be considered an achievement. If someone is injured deep in a cave, it may take days to get them out. Similar perils, therefore, to mountain climbing. Both mountains and a cave can trap you, although in different ways. How does it happen, I ask, that a person can squeeze through a passage but is then unable to get out again? Stephen demonstrates, sitting up straight and pressing his hands down on his ribs. When sliding through a narrow gap, the human rib cage will compress and allow you through. Once through, your ribs pop out again, and you experience the kind of shove and click that sometimes comes when putting together tubular furniture. Except you're in the tube, and it's your ribs that have clicked. It is a system that does not work backwards. Your ribs only compress when going head first. If, as is often the case, the space you've entered is not big enough for you to wiggle around, back around, then you are trapped. You are plugged. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. I ask about the Shannon. These cavers were among the group who, with careful timing, poured dyes into various pots around Quilke. Pots, as you'd mentioned, are the holes and caves in the ground. It's kind of a local name for them, pots. As you may know, the Shannon pot is where the Shannon rises. It's probably the most famous of them. Poured dyes into various pots around Quilke, then traveled to the Shannon pot to see if any of them emerged there. I had imagined the cavers in muddy overalls, squinting and uncomfortable in the light, sitting at the Shannon pot's rim and waiting for the water to turn pink or green. In fact, tracing experiments do not work like that. The dyes are quickly diluted to invisibility as they travel the waterlogged tunnels, too thin to be seen by the human eye. Charcoal detectors were used. When unopened, these look like tobacco tins and are about the same size. They were placed under the rim of the Shannon pot for a time, then sent to specialist labs for analysis. In this way, the source of the Shannon has been pushed back under Quilka Mountain, back the entire length of the mountain, all the way to its eastern slopes. While I was walking today, the last five or six hours, the Shannon was beneath me. The Shannon has been traced to Pigeon Pot in Fermanagh, meaning it has not been just been pushed back miles, it has been pushed back under the border, into the south. Borders do not mean much to people who spend all their free time underground. Stephen, Jock, and Rocky are unfazed by having demonstrated that the Shannon is a cross-border river. To them, it was just a starting point. The experiments were dyed. 
or timed, sorry. The dye traveled from Pigeon Pot to the Shannon Pot at more than 100 meters per hour, a speed that shows the water was in free flow under the mountain. They had proved there was a tunnel. The next channel was locating it and then maybe opening it up. The caver's ultimate goal is to join the dots, traveling the whole system between Pigeon Pot and Shannon Pot. This is a distance of six miles. Consider the implications of this ambition, and it becomes hard to grasp. A mountain must have a peak, but a continuous traversable route under Quilka may not even exist. The dyes show that there is a link, but that does not mean a human being can travel it. Years could be spent exploring, winding, rib-crushing caves without finding a connection, but never, for sure, proving its non-existence either. It is extraordinarily tantalizing. After the next bend, a bend taking a day to get around, you may meet a wall of shale, the water sloshing around your boots and disappearing through bores only the diameter of your wrist. No further progress possible. Or, around the next bend, you may find yourself in a massive chamber, able to walk upright through an echoing cathedral, pillars of limestone and calamite towering above you, a place no one has ever seen before. It has taken extraordinary effort and commitment, but the Shannon Group has still only opened a fraction of the Pigeon Pot, Shannon Pot system. How long might it take you to open up the whole route? I asked Stephen. He laughs and shakes his head. It would take 20 people three lifetimes, he says. For big achievements, you must think across generations. The tunnels only relent in tiny increments. The pace of exploration is best measured in feet per year, like erosion or the movement of the Earth's plates. Tunnels can also sit still for years between pushes, untouched, until the right set of people come together and decide to give it a go. Of course, these short breaks are nothing compared to the millennia these voids have sat undisturbed and untitled before the likes of Stephen, Jock, and Rocky crawl in and let torchlight bounce off the enamel walls and think up a new name. Thank you. Um, I'll read one more bit. This, I've never read this bit before either. Uh, hopefully it's not too boring. Um, so today, I drove from Belfast, which is where I live, here to Sligo, and that means a lot of the way you're going through a quite specific terrain, which I'm sure you've heard of, called the Drumlin Belt, which extends from right across Ireland. And uh, quite a lot of it corresponds with Ireland's border. Um, so when I was walking the border, I saw a lot of drumlins, lots. And uh, I guess I got quite into them. Um, <laughs> strange habit. Lately, uh, well, it was when he was six, my wife said to my son, a six-year-old son, she said, do an impression of daddy. And, she said, and, he's, and he curled up his face and he said, Jeez, I love drumlins. <laughs> which, is, which I hadn't realized I went on about drumlins so often. Although it is sort of true that over driving somewhere, I will tend to point out a nice drumlin. And I go, that's a nice drumlin there. So I guess, so I guess that's where he's coming from. And today, as I was driving from Belfast, I saw there was nobody else in the car, but I acknowledged some nice drumlins as I was coming down. Um, so if you're going to write a book about the border and you're looking at the landscape itself, among other things, then you've got to, you've got to have a bit about drumlins, a bit. Maybe, but maybe it's too much. Three times, actually, I've, I've done events and people who've read my book have come up to me and said, you really like drumlins, don't you? <laughs> so maybe it's a bit too long. Maybe it's, you know, anyway, see what you think. It starts a chapter called Highs, Lows. The border is many moods, but not as many as me. I walk by the river between encroaching hills. I'm always heading into a fold that, when I get there, I find leads to another that is just the same. The same dead-eyed cows stand in their fields chewing grass, the same bright yellow tags in their ears. When it is time to make camp, I march straight up a round hill that is unpopulated and divided into about five fields. These hills are called drumlins, and there are thousands of them, and a thick band stretching across Ireland 
much of it corresponding with the borderland. Although this particular round hill farm is found in many parts of the world, the name comes from here. It means little ridge. At the top of the drumlin, the relief of far horizon strikes me in a way that is almost bodily. I feel I've pushed through some sort of a cling film ceiling. Up here, I'm bathed in new oxygen. The sky is huge, and in every direction, I can see thousands of cresting hills, or miles of cresting hills. I whoop out loud, using my voice box for the first time in hours. The sudden openness boosts, boosts my mood. That thing about the voice box, I should point out, I, when I started this journey, I thought I'd been bumping into people all the time, but in actual fact, Boris pretty thinly populated, so you could, that could easily happen. You could go half a day and, and not speak to anyone. Um, I feel lucky to be here, to have the freedom to pursue this quest. It is summer. I'm healthy. I'm free. Later, I pitch my tent and then lay out my tarp as a picnic blanket. I'm, I'm on the sardines and noodles. My tent and tarp could be seen by anybody, but I feel an open hillside gives its own kind of protection. If you're going to sleep in thinly populated country, under the sky, it is better to be exposed, to be boldly present. Skulking away only puts you in the path of other skulkers and makes you attractive to them. The sky is pink-gray. I watch the curved evening shadow inch up the drumlin towards me. I've read descriptions of drumlins that compare them to ripples left on sand after the tide has gone out. They can be a mile or three long, cigar-shaped, indeed like ridges in sand, but Ireland's border drumlins have a much closer length-to-height ratio, and the description does not fit. A border drumlin is more like an egg, half buried in its side. You might also say a drumlin is like a church's copper dome, colored with exposure, or a desert dune on a planet with green sand. Border drumlins are often symmetrical on one axis, so simple geometric descriptions come to mind. Looked at head-on, some are the top fifths of perfect circles, or emerald suns rising from a plane. One aspect of their arrangement reinforces this sense of geometric order. Many drumlins don't merge with their neighbors. Rather, each rises and falls from the same flat plane. They may rub their outer circumferences against others, but they are mainly independent. Look at a lot of drumlins together, and other metaphors occur. One writer describes driving by drumlins as passing by an endless roller coaster. A walker's interpretation, my interpretation, is of a landscape slowly filling, then exhaling. There's something oceanic here. Drumlins look like full sea swells, bulging more to one end, but still a long way from breaking. From my caps, campsite, I can see miles of drumlins. Between any two, I can see another, and the caps of others beyond, until I'm looking across the crests of a wavy sea. Waves, swells, ripples. Water imagery often gets into the descriptions of drumlins. Perhaps when seeking me metaphors, writers have consciously or unconsciously drawn from the process that made this landscape. During the last ice age, glaciers passed this way, a few hundred feet above my campsite. Down here was the uneven bed of a, con of a concealed sea. Although pressurized and sluggish under the glaciers, the water did flow, slowly dragging rocks together in drifts across the seabed and pressing them into hills. A drumlin's orientation tells us the direction the Ice Age flow was traveling when it was shaped, the tapered end pointing the way. If you pick up some loose soil, press it between your two palms, then work it in a so circular motion, you'll create a rounded form and you'll have made the model of a, bo of a border drumlin in a way very like the real ones were made. Drumlins define many stretches of the borderland. More, they help create the borderland in the first place. It is a land form well suited to ambushes, harrowing, and conspiring. There were always hills to hide behind and high ground to claim. Local knowledge was an enormous advantage, so the outsider was hampered, denied a view, forward, and easily got lost. The drumlin belt was a barrier. It is hard to imagine a center forming anywhere in the drumlin belt. This landscape tended towards the peripheral, helping distinct cultures evolve north and south. A geographer called Eston Evans wrote many books about Ulster and often considered drumlins. He was fascinated by rural traditions and handmade so objects, 
loving the way the design of spades, baskets, or boats changed from county to county, showing the slow currents of influence that moved under folk craft. Evans wished for Ulster to develop a regional consciousness that could jostle along confidently with others in the rest of Ireland and beyond. Evans described Ireland's drumlin belt as a necklace of beads and also gave us a collective term for them, a swarm. But he was less interested in the metaphors that could be applied to drumlins than in what drumlins could do. He suggested that living among drumlins created a certain psychological types. He wrote, he said, one might think of the molded drumlins as molding in turn the outlook of the farmers who lived among them. Suggesting that living in small valleys had given some, he suggested that living in small valleys had given some people an outlook, an outlook concerned mainly with the immediate, whereas life on the uplands, plateaus, and naked bogs found further west along the border produced people of far sight, imagination, and poetry. There is certainly a contrast. I know I find a day down among the hills oppressive, although sheltered, while hiking the highlands often feels airy and expansive. It's too bad Evans had to fall for stereotypes and apply this pair of mindsets to Ireland's two main religious groups. He felt the uplands were Catholic, the valleys Protestant. It is hard to know who's worse, worse served by this ethnic labeling. It's not true either, I should mention. Compared to maps of Ireland, one of religious dist distribution and one of drumlins, and you'll see that people of all sorts are found in all sorts of landscapes. We are a little more complicated than Evans could credit. But I think I see what he was trying to get at with drumlins, and it's well-intentioned. He wished to show us two primary land forms in Ireland, open and closed, hilltop and valley, and use them as a metaphor for diversity among the people. He believed that em embracing this diversity could lead to a culturally productive borderland. There are troughs, there are crests. The land undulates with these and other rhythms. Evans believed that we should try to enjoy our different values and learn to live with pluralism in a social landscape as varied as the one under our feet. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to do a short uh, question and answer period. I'll ask a couple of questions, take a few from the audience, and then we have a, an open mic session after that. So come on up. Thank you so much, both of you. That was great. Um, Marion, do you, do you mind if I start with you? I wanted to ask where writing sits for you in your overall work as an archaeologist. Yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting, and it's something I've been kind of exploring different ways of doing it. I, I guess I've been an archaeologist for over 20 years, and most of that has been writing, whether it's you know the results of excavations or interpretive work. Um, and I guess as I progress more, I find it, I'm more interested in kind of mixing different disciplines, and, and then that kind of results in a different type of writing as well. Uh, because often, you know, archaeology is so fascinating, and everybody is fascinated by it, but often the way it's written by archaeologists, it can be very dry, very scientific, and it loses what it's about. It's about people and, and their experiences. It's just that they happen to be dead now. Um, so yeah, I think I'm seeing that more, that I'm more interested in, in developing it out. But yeah, I mean, really, writing has always been part of it, uh, you know, part of, of finding something, trying to interpret it, and then writing. And if you don't write it and it doesn't get out there, then really that information is lost and, and your excavation has come to nothing, really, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it's, it's a really essential part of, of being an archaeologist. Mm. Thank you. Gareth, I wanted to ask you about mapping because I know you are also a map maker. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know if you would talk a little bit about writing and mapping and the if you see an interplay between them, how that works for you. Yes. Yeah, well, that book that I just read from is, is, is illustrated with a map as well. And uh, rather than a contents page, it has a map and, uh, and you can kind of. You, you, you can, the page numbers are along the line of the border. Um, so they're pretty uh, closely knit. Yeah, for me, they are uh, closely related processes. I mean, it's quite interesting that we use the same verb, you know? You read a map and you read a book. Does that tell us anything? 
maybe nothing. But, <laughs> but maybe it tells a lot. Maybe, maybe in some fundamental way, they're kind of they're a similar project. You know, if you look deeply enough, maybe a book is kind of helping you find your way. Maybe a book is helping you locate yourself. Maybe a book is um, uh, a kind of a guide as well. So, so perhaps there is something to that. I certainly have no difficulty seeing the connection of them, especially in a, a book like that where you're trying to open up a landscape. I mean, a big influence for me, I'm sure some of you know, is work Tim Robinson in the West of Ireland who, who, who wrote beautiful books about the Irons and Connemara and made beautiful maps of them as well. And in a sense, making the map was the thing that got him out into the landscape where he then, where he then could have the sort of literary reaction as well. So for me, they worked uh, yeah, completely together. I was, one map I was making was called the Map of Connections, which were unofficial crossing points crossing the border. So uh, all the roads and things I just ignored because they were already on maps. Um, I was just looking for places where people maybe had put down a plank across a stream or some stepping stones or a gate in a hedgerow. There was loads of them. So these connections then weren't in any other map. And I started, I, got, I got, became aware of them very early in the journey, probably the first day on land. Um, and I started photographing them. And I wasn't really sure what I liked about them, but it soon became a bit of an obsession. The problem with, the old, problem with the, old, the connections was as soon as I started looking for them, then that was boom. I was, had to stick right close to the line. I had to be right on it because many of them were very small. So that really sh shaped the journey. It wasn't some meandering through the border corridor. I, I stayed right on the line the whole time. I could always see it at the very least. Sometimes it was at the bottom of the field, but I was always within sight of the border. And that really, that, that ended up, of course, being really fundamental in, shape, in shaping the border. In some ways, they're kind of like an archaeology, to be honest. With you. Because like I said, you don't meet people. If you do that, if you stick right on the landscape all the time on the borderline, you don't really go through villages much, you know. So um, I ended up seeing people through the marks they made instead and through the things they've left behind. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, there is a lot of archaeology and, and, uh, and history in it as well, because I ended up getting to know the people through the stuff that was sort of littering in the borderland. Mm. which uh, has advantages and disadvantages. The big advantage, though, is that the people are, who are dead 5,000 years are as accessible as, as the people who just passed. So, and that ended up shaping the whole project. There were a lot of cans. You walked across a lot of cans in that book. Cans? Did you notice that? Yes, you, you keep walking across crushed cans wherever oh, you're Oh, yes, yeah. well, there is a bit of that. Yeah, yeah. there is, yeah. Yeah, well, a lot of fly tipping. Yes, yeah. I think... Um, mm. I think there might be some weird psychological reason for that, though. I think like the border, the border. is this kind of troubled place that people mm -hmm. makes a lot of people uneasy, and they're not kind of sure where their identity sits with it, and they're not sure if they're supposed to be angry about it, mm -hmm. and uh, and so it becomes this kind of non-space. And if you want to get rid of some old rubbish, you bring it to the border, because it seems like the right spot, this sort of psychological junkyard, mm -hmm. and uh, especially bad Donegal Tyrone, yeah, and of course not just cans, cars. Sofas. Yeah, there's quite a bit. So, Marion, this is a question probably everybody asks you, but I'm <coughs> curious, and so I figure others are curious, which is why caves and how... Maybe t tell us a little bit about your first experience in a cave or what drew you yeah, into them. It was kind of an accident. I was um, looking to do a master's topic in UCC in the 90s, and my supervisor you know, was giving me different topics and I'd go away for a couple of weeks and I think, no, nah, that's too boring. And, you know, after about four or five attempts, he said, look, somebody needs to look at caves. Nobody has done it before in Ireland. Um, and at the time, because nothing had been done on cave archaeology, we were worried that we wouldn't get, you know, a, a one-year thesis out of it. And, of course, that just started then, you know, and, and it became, it's such a, a rich, really rich area. Um, yeah, and I guess there have been lots of different experiences. You know, I, after the Masters, I was in Spain and I got to see Altamira, the, the real cave as opposed to the replica. And something about that experience was really kind of profound in, you, you know, you're looking at these handprints that are 30,000 years old and, you know, it's that immediacy. You don't really feel that distance. Um, and I guess every cave kind of has a different story and the archaeology can be quite different. So I always say caves are like your grandmother's handbag. You could find anything <laughs> in them. <laughs> and, you know, the stories or the narratives are always just so different. So 
Yeah, um, I think I realized at that time I was living in Spain for a few years teaching English. And my boss, who was Irish, one day turned and he said, you're always talking about caves. So it's like the drumlin thing. I was like, I never talk about caves. And he's saying, <laughs> you know, just go back to Ireland and, you know, do cave stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and I guess, you know, then another kind of major point was uh, we were, I was at La Cru with my son about five or six years ago to look at, you know, incredible passage tombs there. And it had been on my bucket list for years. And I thought, oh, I really want to see these sites. Um, and when I got inside, you know, they're incredible, stunning art, but I felt like a bit of disappointment in my first thought was, oh, it's, it's not like a cave or it's not a cave. And yeah, then I kind of realized, yeah, it's, it's really just so fascinating. I guess it's like any type of research, the deeper you go into it, that just become, you know, you just go deeper and deeper and, and it becomes then just so, so interesting or so fascinating, mm -hmm. yeah. I think I've meandered off there on the board or something. <laughs> um, I've got one more question for you, Garrett, before I look for some questions from the audience. But sure. just so you read from the fictional piece, mm -hmm. and um, and I, am I assuming that this is pitched towards young adult readers? Or uh, well, no? I didn't really think of it that way. Um, okay. it could be, I guess it could be. Yeah. Um, not particularly, though, necessarily. I just I mentioned that because Garrett's previous three books before the, the Border book were young adult books. But uh, in general, anyway, how do you look at writing fiction, nonfiction, and do you, what, what's your approach in working in those different genres? Fiction, nonfiction, well, yeah. I mean, uh, you, you heard from that little bit of the article guy in Column Kill, it's still about landscape, really. Mm. So in some ways, the, mm. the root impetus is kind of similar. Mm. Um, and when I was writing one of those kids' books, I was also I started doing some walking. I started walking stretches of the border as well, and I kind of thought, "Oh, this is handy. This means I get to walk along and daydream and think about this other book I've to write." So that kind of walking process. I mean, lots of people have commented on the Wordsworth, among others, that the walking rhythm is quite a is quite a good rhythm for writing for composition. So there's that kind of uh, very core impetus. Hard to, hard to say anything else. One thing though I have to say on slightly uh, digressing from your point is that that story, the article again called Kill, yeah, it's about a young, she's probably, well, I did my leaving when I was 16, so I suppose she's 60. I didn't get as many points as her, but. So, and I, anytime I find myself writing fiction, I always find myself writing about, about young people. And, uh, and I, I, I suppose the older I get, the more I think, you're kind of set by the time you're about 16, you're 16 or 17. I think that it kind of all happens then, which I'm not sure if that's liberating or depressing thought, <laughs> but I, I think everything that important that happens to you has already happened to you at that age, and everything else is just the outworkings. And I find it, it's something else I'm writing at the moment. I just find myself writing about teenagers and young people all the time. Mm -hmm. I think uh, everything else just seems to be the kind of the... Uh, the outworkings of how you were made in those in those early years. So uh, I find it very I find it difficult to write about adults, to be honest. Hmm. Interesting. I'm looking for anyone with a question for Garrett or Marianne. Yeah, Ollie. I saw your hand. Yeah. Have we got a mic? Come oh, up. we have a mic. Yeah. <clears throat> Just to Marianne, I found the way you read. Sorry you read your work to be really kind of poetic. I was wondering if you've ever written poetry. Well, no, and I was actually saying to Gareth beforehand that it's the first time I've read, you know, a lecture, but I've never read my work. And actually that's the first time I opened that book since I published it five years ago. So yeah, I have started experimenting a little bit with poetry very, very recently. I've written a few, uh, none published, so yeah. Um, and actually, that's one of the reasons I like coming here, because I see people like you and, and other people come up and read their work. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really good for me, actually. So that's something I'm exploring. But whether I'm any good at it or not is another thing. But thank you for the compliment. Somebody back there with their hand up? Oh, and Margaret here in the front. We'll get to the back there, too. Hi, my question is for Gareth. Um, I was just wondering, in your travels along the Drumlins, 
did you come across any of the shay? The fairy folk? <laughs> <laughs> or have any sense, sensing of the fairy folk that are supposed to dwell in those places? Uh, no. <laughs> to be honest. They have to be in the drumlins. They have to be in the drumlins. Mm -hmm. But why are those places particularly? Drumlins particularly? Or the border? See, the border is a political construct, isn't it? So it's kind of, it doesn't necessarily have to follow uh, uh, stuff that might have been laid down. I mean, a lot of it does. It's been border landscape for a long time. But it doesn't necessarily have to have those associations. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Somewhere like the Bahamas. <laughs> and the bottom part of the teddy bear. Yeah, there, there was a crushing together, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's, mine was largely an historical process. If I was going to get into the supernatural, you could say that I think probably from, well, from the Troubles largely, and because it's, it's been a site of conflict for a long time, and if you read about all that stuff, then you can't help but feel a certain hauntedness mm -hmm. in certain places. Um, when you, and I have a chapter about, the, or a section of a chapter about the disappeared, the people that uh, were killed by the area and buried, a couple of them along the border. And when you're in that, there's one particular spot on uh, Sleeve Bay, where Clum, uh, Clum Bay was, uh, was buried, and he's never been found, and they've, they've dug up acres and acres looking for him. And it's very hard to walk that way without feeling uh, a, a kind of a haunted kind of quality about it. But that, I don't think that's inherent in the landscape, or is it? It is quite, it is quite a bleak spot. That there are a few pretty bleak stretches when one feels it's quite evacuated the border, you know, and it's not just from the troubles; it's from you know right back to the 19th century, uh, ruined cottages, old potato drills that are fading back into the landscape. There's the sense of uh, absence about many stretches of it. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is just a question for Gareth. Um, I was just wondering how you managed to walk along the lakes. I uh, was sort of thinking of Loch McNean and Loch Melvin, because does the border go through those does, lakes? Yeah. I was just wondering what, what you, how you, how you well, um, manage those. Yeah, I had this principle about sticking close to the line. So whenever there's large bodies of water, I canoed it. And I canoed with a friend of mine, because I don't actually know much about canoeing. But he knew how to handle a canoe. And he had a canoe, a big Canadian canoe. You take two people, and we could have our camping gear in the middle. And, uh, and so we canoed those bits. So we start, you start at Carlingford, which you can canoe pretty quickly. So that's probably a day. Then quite a lot of the border is the foil river, you know? So that was probably three or four days on the foil and lock foil. And, and yeah, Loch McNean around there. Didn't canoe uh, Melvin, to be honest with you. I just walked the coast there. But it does go in, the border does go into Melvin, you're right, but about, a, I, don't know, I don't know, a short distance. So uh, yeah, just followed the water. This idea of going to stick into the line, no matter what. This was the kind of the notion. And uh, I suppose you want to give the thing a kind of stridency. So you set yourself obscure tasks, and then you stick with it. Although, to be honest with you, as regards the book, Paddy was such, he's the guy I canoed with. He's such good company, and really witty guy, and really funny guy. So he was great. Like, And I think his bits are probably the best bits in the book, really. So uh, I should have just kept it with me the whole time. Uh, uh. Maybe time for one more. <clears throat> Nobody's mentioned Brexit. Amazing. Ah, it's no harm, yeah. I'll be I'll get enough <laughs> of that. Yeah, you've had enough of that, yeah. Um, a question for Marion. Um, in your excavations of caves, you say you come across remarkable and unusual things. Have you ever thought of using them as the focus for a, a fictional story? Yeah, I mean, I was interested in the, the question that Alice had about writing fiction versus non-fiction. I don't think I could really write uh, fiction. I, I think for me, you know, I could do creative writing if it's based on, you know, facts or real things. But I don't know, maybe I just lack that creativity. Um, yeah, and I know other people have, you know, other archaeologists in the UK or osteoarchaeologists have written really good, you know, fictional works. Um, but yeah, for me, that yeah, I don't think I'd have those skills. Yeah, I think I'm more interested in writing about the stuff in a more accessible. And by accessible, I don't mean downplaying it or dumbing it down. 
but actually making it something that people want to read about, you know? Um, because, yeah, just one comes to mind, um, Skeleton of a Boy that I excavated from a cave in Clare about seven or eight years ago. He was about 14 or 15, and he died of malnutrition, um, probably perished in the cave. His family or whoever had never recovered him probably couldn't find him. He was probably hiding there. And, you know, things like this, for me, it's, you know, you don't need to fictionalize that, but the job of maybe an archaeologist is to make that kind of very sad, poignant, relatable story accessible to people so it's not just in some obscure academic journal. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> it's time to transition, but before we do to um, the open mic, I want to say thank you again very much to Marion Dowd and Gareth Carr. Thank you. So Lindsay Gordon is going to be taking over for the open mic section. Uh, Lindsay, where are you? Welcome to the open mic part of the word, and the first reader is Patrick. Good evening, folks. Uh, this poem is uh, relevant and quite poignant. Uh, I gave it a title, Wonderland Doorways, in the end. <clears throat> a preamble through the homeless streets of park life, where the drunk clings to the pub doorframe like a parrot on a perch. Afraid of the fast-moving world that passes the doorway, repeating the same sentence time and again. Mental is my health and its state of care. Lighting a cigarette, puffing like a door dragon, throwing the butt into the moving world beyond, like some metaphorical joke on life itself. As the election poster's face stares back at him with a benign Cheshire cat grin, bag tied to the lamppost in a hall of mirrors cascade, off up the high street and on into the beyond, where its media words of promise have no more meaning than the warning on a pack of cigarettes. As the parroting parable of political fables blows down the street in a tumbleweed of leaflets onto the cleansed riverbank where the tent that was his home is gone, leaving him trapped in a wonderland doorway that leads nowhere on the streets of park life. This other uh, poem occurred when I was on my way into uh, town to get credit before New Year's Eve, actually. And it's interesting that the comment about the hares and uh, the fairy folk <laughs> in disguise is quite novel. I uh, came across a hare that stopped me in my car in the middle of the road, so it spurred a poem. Um, the hare crosses, my, crosses the palm of my destiny without, care, without cause or malice like a bouncing proton in a random divergence hop, at the dawning of a New Year's breath, where all and more will unfold before me in transient dreams of world's new horizons, found in the palm of one's hand and the flip of a Judas coin in the other. Destiny is to be found in the hop of a hare's breath on the misty cold road of time. There we go, folks. Next is Margaret Hoffman. Thank you. 
This is neither poetry nor prose, except for the last tiny bit. Yesterday in Alice's class, we read W.B. Yeats' poem, The Man Who Dreamed of Fairyland, and pondered on its meaning. A thought which occurred to me concerning the last stanza was Yeats' subtle reference to his unrequited love for Maud Gone. The images of silver and gold run through the poem like tapestry thread, highlighting the emotional imagery. Following on, we were gifted with a workshop facilitated and performed by Sinead Sexton, another Sligo IT student, currently researching Eva Gore Booth for her master's degree. Sinead asked us to do a free writing exercise using a prompt from Eva Gore Booth's poetry. Eva, apparently, was another person from whom Yeats suffered an episode of unrequited love. For my free writing exercise, I chose the line prompt you were the moonlight, I lived in the sun, from Eva Gorbooth's poem, From the Body to the Soul. My meager words attempt to capture that sense of love denied, felt by Yeats, perhaps. You were the moonlight, I lived in the sun. Silver and gold, we were precious together, so I thought. But you knew we were as different as night and day. Longing to merge, I shone, glittering love's searing glow. Distantly, you repelled my light, coolly sparkling ice, always just out of reach. Next is Seth Tui. This is a poem I wrote last year, and I don't really know what it's about. I mean, it obviously, there was obviously something that sparked it, but there's lots of things it could mean. It's called Nighttime Oaths. The strength in darkness isn't always the same in the sun. It's easy to be proud when prying eyes aren't on you. The blanket of night hides your blush and fear is tucked up tight. One can stand tall and angry, determined to share the truth while wrapped up snug with the support of the shadows. But in the warm of the day, a lie slips out, smooth as honey, but nowhere near as sweet. The bitter, sticky residue lingers in my throat, and I want to take it back, but it's too late. My breathing is shallow, and my heart is hammering. Next time, that weaselly little voice in my head promises, but we both know he lies. Now it's Ollie Lenehan. Vampires on the night link. Blinking lights through dust mites and you're on so soon. And the night is purply gray and there is no moon. And you say what you mean and I think it through. And I say what I think to you. Blinking lights on roadsides, your lights are all green. And I am sharp at the edges, silver sheen. And I want to cry with it all and think it through but there's not a thought in my head, only you. My chest expands with the feeling, my heart swells, rattling and spinning and reeling, and you can tell. And this is gonna change me my whole being through. And you know, and you've done it before, who else could it be but you? The long way home in the AM, and now we're here. It's the same place as last time, but with you it's clear. I feel it so much and it's all so new. The experience, the physicality, the ordeal of knowing you and you spindle and turn and hug me before bed, and you leave me in the front room hanging on by a thread, and I sleep straight away, witch's brew, and everything is different now that there's you. Now Jessamine O'Connor and Ollie are going to do a piece together. Uh, yeah, basically, Ollie's helping. I'm gonna sit down. Uh, so this is called Dead Language. He calls it a dead language. Tell him Shay is dead language, Rafi. And I flinch. I'll just get him. Though all I have are names. Keach Volgamach. Items and actions. Nihus Genevena. Like beads. Showed him Winka. Missing their string. Gone and shrung. I can't make it make sense. 
Ni fedu la mavertli a yenavlo. Can't put them together. Ni la manan di kanga la kela. But I hold them tightly. Ach berem grimer her godoch dain. Snarling at him. Drain him lash. Clutching my gems. Is he dim glock? A small voice crouched. Guy ishal er nuggedy. Behind my tongue. Er hul ma scornig. Just waiting. Ik fehev gefodach. To spring out. Kun lain to mach. When he calls it dead. Nor a hug and shade tang a marver he. Amadon. Amadon. The fairy says. Er she. Thanks so much. Ali, who has a beautiful Irish, which I don't have. And this is just a short poem that is, I'm kind of writing at the moment for a friend I don't see enough of. Uh, I don't have a title yet. Um, I was just starting to write about you when Ping message delivered after four weeks. I just started to say how I hate the love in your voice when you talk about death, the relief you look so forward to, the peace, and how, although we always cackle together with relish, saying, yes, we need a break from this living shit, eventually I stop, remind you sternly that, no, you are needed here. You're not finished, nowhere near done. And all right, it's bad now, but imagine how much worse it could get. How you always leave the conversation laughing, so when I don't hear anything, since your slurred voice tells me you're in the clouds and a month goes by, straight to machine, I start to write about you and in that very moment, you come back to earth. Next is Colm Lawler. Um, I was in the same uh, workshop as Margaret mentioned earlier, and I'm going to read the thing that I wrote. Um, I edited it afterwards such that the original quote isn't actually in it anymore, but it follows the same thing. It's very short. If you are the moon, then I am the sun. We can see each other most days if we squint. Your face, whether jagged or trodden, still lights up when it spins around to see me. And yet we are distant. Solitary satellites spinning forever in free fall through the void, yet chained in orbit. Someday, someone will come back and plant their flag, claim once again you are habitable, and no one will get near me. Next is Ian Doherty. Weirdly, a lot of talk about uh, fairies tonight. I uh, once heard a think piece in this place about why believing in fairies in this day and age is, well, stupid. A position I maintain, but this one details a time one of them paid me a visit. Spoiler alert, it kind of sucked. So I'm paralyzed. I'm back at school. Why are we wearing SS uniforms? I should take this off. Now I'm naked. I should leave. Sneak outside. I think I'm asleep. I should get some practice in while I can. I take off. I'm flying. Flying, falling, flying, falling. I'm in the hospital. The nurse comes in. It's a woman I know, but it's also Lena Dunham. Care to play doctor? No. Don't look at me like that. You're just part of my subconscious. Hey, what are you doing with that scalpel? Ah! I'm awake. I can't move. What's that horrible noise? It's like a lawnmower. It's my stupid brother in the next room. Shut up. But it just comes out as... At least I'm not hallucinating this time. Wait. Why do I suddenly feel a creeping sense of existential dread? Ah, oh, shit, she's back. Close my eyes, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Can't breathe, have to fight, call for help. Arr. Leave me alone, you witch. I'll be visited by who? The fairy king. Then it's over. What time is it? 3 a.m. Shit, that means I have to go back to sleep. Okay, asleep, dreaming, flying, falling. Why do I keep trying? Back at school. Something's coming. Have to get out. Can't see. It's all around. Get to the door. I made it. I'm awake. Can't move. Oh, come on. Twice in one night. Something's coming. It's him. Some leering monstrosity. An unholy mixture of animal, vegetable, and mineral. Can't breathe. Close my eyes. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Help me. A bang. It's over. Why does my elbow hurt? Was I thrashing? It's good that I know what this is. In previous centuries, I might have sought the help of an exorcist or a witch hunter. 
but I live in an age of science, and there's no cure. <laughs> now is Maria Hamill. Hello. This is a poem I called A Normal Love Poem. I thought about writing a love poem of ice cream kisses and never-ending goodbyes, or how galaxies are cheap Christmas lights when it comes to your eyes. But I thought about how I'd have to hide you in a poem about you, for I don't know what they would have do done. Sorry, <laughs> for I don't know what they would do if they knew. That's the <laughs> So we're on to the last person for the evening. I want to thank you all for coming and staying for the open mic. And the last person of the night is Cara Maxwell. This is as yet untitled. <clears throat> I tell you the story of the six cats emphatically, and my left hand sends your pint flying, but you're still too in love, to me to, too in love with me to mind very much. It's in the eyes, you see, all in the eyes, the way they crinkle at the corners when I come back from the bar, or how they follow my leg to the hip when I dance to some god-awful song. Three whiskeys in, and I'm anyone's, but I'm only yours. Always yours, really. Not quite my own yet, but one day I will be. For now, I am just happy to write you bad love poetry and get you two pan it all in the morning. <laughs> Good night. Thanks very much for coming, everyone. Bye.